Okay, um, welcome back. The, uh, this is lecture eight, which is on lists. I wrote list one up there because there's going to be a number of list lectures. This will be the first one, and it may end up being slightly less than a full lecture period. The middle one will be a little bit more than a lecture period, uh, perhaps, and then the last one um, may be less. Typically, um, this is treated as, these next three lectures are treated as sort of one big bleed, you know, bleed through topic, and I just break it up by whenever the lecture happens to end. I'm going to try and have a slightly better conceptual uh, breakdown as I talk to you here, so I'd, I'll, I'll find a good stopping point for the video. But keep in mind, these next three lectures are basically one big shot. And if I, I'm not going to put it in a three-hour video. No one wants to watch video for three hours. But um, I'll try and have good conceptual stopping points at which uh, um, to stop. And then uh, we will pick up from there. So things may be a little bit less or more than 50 minutes at times. Um, and that's, that's uh, despite my propensity to talk more when I've got all of you, or got none of you in front of me. Um, this is, this is, I'm warning you, will be a little bit more than 50 minutes or, or less, despite, uh, re never mind, I'm babbling. Okay, so, <laughs> I'm laughing right now. So, um, the idea of lists, when we uh, discuss them, is the first we need to talk about the list ADT. And uh, on the last lecture, which I just finished five minutes ago, I was talking about the idea of an abstract data type. And we were referring to the idea that the abstract data type first consists of the uh, abstract data that we're worrying about, and secondly, consists of a list of operations. And so when we are uh, dealing with things, well, this would be the idea of a list. The abstract data would be um, concept here would be a, a collection of elements all the same type generally and in linear order. And generally, part of what is built into the ADT, though this will be covered by the operations, would be that we have free access to all elements. By which I mean we're not restricted to only looking at the first element or only looking at the last one. We have a, a list we can just read everything and, and change everything or insert anything or remove anything wherever we, wherever we want. And so to draw this out, here we have an idea of, say, A1, A3, A6, A2, A5, A4. There's an example of a six-element list. You notice I haven't listed the uh, elements in a particular order. I've just put A1, A3, whatever. The idea I'm trying to get across there is this is not necessarily sorted. I simply have a collection of elements. It can be in whatever order I need it to. However, when I say it's in linear order, by what, what I mean by that is there is a definite element that our uh, operations will recognize as the first element, and another one that we'll recognize as being in the second position, and the third position, and the fourth position, and the fifth position, and the sixth position. So the positions are clear. And if I'm going to insert something here, let's say I have an A7 now that I insert it into here. Now A7 is the second element, A3 is now the third, A6 is the fourth, A2 becomes the fifth rather than the fourth as it was earlier, and so on. So that's what we mean by a linear order, that these are actually kept in some sort of a sequence, and we might alter that sequence through our operations, we might alter it by inserting new elements, removing new elements. There may well be a, a member function we decide to add to our list class that will sort these values, but as a general abstract data type, all we are concerned about is that there's some defined linear order that we can consistently rely on. That if you put an element as the first element, it remains the first element until we either remove it or add some new element as the first one, or do something else to alter the list somehow. So examples of this, you know, you can imagine just writing a grocery list on a piece of paper, and it's basically that same kind of idea. You know, you write lettuce and ham and, and uh, spaghetti sauce or whatever other, other things you're trying to buy, and they, the, the one you wrote at the top of the list remains at the top of the list unless you kind of write something else above it. And you can strike items from the list and, and add items in to the list in, in the spaces in between what you wrote before. So it's, it's much like that. So it's a general sort of all-purpose uh, abstract data type for dealing with a number of collections in very simple ways. When we need to start dealing with things in some more complex ways, we'll have some more complex classes. 
but just for the purpose of holding elements and perhaps traversing from beginning to end of our collection, a list is a very nice way to go. Now, as far as the operations on this data, the question is, well, what kind of operations might be useful? And we can consider, well, um, one thing we might certainly want to do is to insert. So let's say we have an insert function. We're going to insert some value x in some position. I'm going to write a question mark there because we're going to come back to this issue in a minute of exactly how do we refer to the position we want to insert at. But we might imagine that the insert function would, in general, need to explain you know, exactly where to insert x. It's not enough just to say, dump a of 7 into the collection I had on the last slide. We need to also point out where a7 should be inserted. And perhaps there's some default assumption about where it goes, and then we can override that with some specific information. We'll see. We'll talk about that later on. But the idea would be that somehow we need to make it clear in this function, in the specification or whatever, where a7 is supposed to go. And so that's the question mark is. Um, four. We may also, of course, want to remove some value, and so we say remove the value at a certain spot, or we might say simply find the value x and remove it wherever it may be. Um, we may want to retrieve a value from a particular, uh, a particular position. We may want to um, find the length of the list. Certainly, there are the big three, so we have, you know, we want to be able to assign one uh, list to another, uh, you know, a copying procedure. Uh, we may want to clear a list out completely and say it started out empty, make it empty again. So there are a number, number of things we might do, and I could go on uh, elaborating on this idea forever, but there are a number of functions we might add and uh, or operations we might want to perform on this list. We might sort it, we might, who knows what. The point I want to make here is that the list of operations is by no means a standard list. So there's not some you know, uh, um, secret uh, piece of paper held somewhere under lock and key that says these are the functions we add to a list class. It's really your choice as a designer. And as you start to create your own data structures, which will be similar to the ones we look at here, or modifications of them, or hybrids of, of one or more of them, the idea will be that it's up to you to design the interface. And we will talk in a second about a very interesting issue involving interface design and, and exactly what, how, we have to, how detailed we might have to think about the interface to our, our class. But the idea is mainly that the abstract concept of a list that we talked about earlier on the previous slide is basically what a list is. And there are certainly some standard operations you will see. Generally, there's some way to insert somewhere and remove somewhere. But the particular collection and the particular parameters they take is something that will vary from list class to list class. These abstract data types we talk about are not something that is set in stone. There's just general guidelines as to what a list is, what a tree is, what a graph is, and the details are left up to you know, whoever happens to be writing that class. And we're just going to be discussing the general details of what these 80 abstract data types typically are and the kind of things they typically provide. So, I don't want you to think that the uh, particular interface list is set in stone for each one of these classes. Though for some classes it's more set in stone than others. And certain ex functions are expected more strongly for some classes than others. And certain functions may be eliminated or, or the advice may be don't add this. And that might be a more strong suggestion for some classes than for others. And we'll, we, we will talk about that uh, soon enough. So the question now is, we have this question mark. How exactly do we refer to this spot? And that will be on the next slide. We'll talk about that. We have here some small class, A4, A1, A3, A2. And I now want to insert A5 into here. And I need to notate where. And that's why I was putting that question mark. Where do we insert? What position are we retrieving a value from? Uh, what position are we removing from? And the answer here, there, well, there's a couple of answers. The first one is we could uh, notate that position by index. So I might say here, um, insert the value A5 into location 3. And if we happen to start this at 1, and that's 2, then location 3 would be right now next. That would, right now, A3 would be in 3, and A2 would be in 4. Then we would insert A5 into 3, moving A3 to position 4 and A2 to position 5. So we increase the number of positions in the list every time we add an element. 
which is um, different, than, uh, that different than an array in that we, in a sense, could re possibly re-index every single cell when we deal with inserting into a, a, a list. Where with an array, we typically definitely insert by index. We would say, put the value of 2 inside A of 10, and we would write 2 into A of 10. Or in the last lecture, we talked about various shapes. I would say, I want x of 9 to point to an octagon. And it would point to an octagon rather than a circle or whatever. But we would specifically be referring to an index. And that's often how we deal with arrays. With lists, this idea of indexing is a little bit weaker because, in a sense, every object gets a new index every time you insert something somewhere. But certainly, we could do things by index. We tend not to, however, because this is really an array idea. And if we talk about the array ADT, as we briefly were in the last lecture, and as you kind of will a little bit more in section two, essentially what we're dealing with in the array ADT is doing things by index. And with a list, we tend not to do things by index that often. That tends to be the domain of the array ADT. What lists tend to do instead is by pointer to a position. And the version we'll look at here will be a current pointer. This is the simplest version. Our discussion over the next few uh, lectures will assume that there is some sort of a current position marker built into the class. That is, we'll say our list composed of, say, a 4, a 1, a 3, and a 2. And this is our current position. And whatever the implementation might be, we somehow notate that 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 is our current element, A1. And so our insert function might make the assumption then that the way we would do our insert, um, I just go ahead and pass in A5, and the, the documentation for that function says when you pass in some value to insert, it's inserted after the current position. So I then say, well, since this A1 is the current position, that means A5 should go right here, because it's after the current position. And often what might happen is then, the, along with the documentation, traditionally, we make the newest element whatever is the current position. And so then, now selling the current position would stop being A1 and would be A5 instead. We'd move the current position over to indicate what was most recently inserted, typically. Um, but we'll talk about that later. For now, I'm just going to leave it. The idea here, then, is there are two different ways of expressing this. We can pass in a particular position, or we can have that position built into the list itself. And all we need to do is say, insert A5. And there's, there's some assumption made in the, that's explained to the user in the documentation about how A5 is, or how your element is inserted with respect to the current position, after, before, three cells down, whatever. But the current position defines where the insert is done, and the insert is done then respective to that current position in some way. So you don't need to include your own position. You simply then um, would uh, make use of, of this current position built in. That would, of course, require that you have um, some operations such as uh, a forward one or back one to move that current position from place to place so that if I want to insert after A3 instead of after A1, I would have called forward one first to move the current position from A1 to A3. We may actually even have functions like head or tail that would very quickly make the first or the last element the current position. So those might be potential operations we need, but the idea would be if we're going to base things on a current position, we at the very least would need forward one and backward one to be able to move our current position notated from place to place. To say, well, now I want some other position to be the current position instead of the previous one. Otherwise, we'd be stuck forever inserting after A1, for example, and that would be bad. So typically, uh, uh, choice two is how we would deal with the list class, uh, the, the list ADT, and inserting and such by index is generally left to an array ADT, and that tends to be the defining difference between the two. Sometimes people will add indexing to the, to the uh, list ADT as well, and when you start doing that, it basically blurs the distinction between list and array somewhat, because they're both going to store elements in some particular linear order, and then your only question is, well, what can you do to one class or the other? And so these, are by no means, are very clear definitions between what an array is and what a list is. 
the, the most common definition then tends to be, well, lists we usually don't associate an index set with um, because the index set would change all the time, or the, the index to value mapping would change all the time. And with uh, lists, we tend to instead have particular position markers. What we will look at at the end of the third lecture in this sequence, and which would be lecture 10, and what the, you will cover in uh, section 4 to some extent, is the idea of multiple position pointers that would perhaps either be built into the class or in general would just have access to this class. But our examples for now will deal with exactly one position pointer. We will see later on the concept of having functions that would not just pass in the value, but would pass in the value in a particular position marker. And that would be different than an index. Here we're passing in an index. When we deal with particular positions, we may end up passing in a position marker as well as an argument. But that's still conceptually different than indexing, because we're not saying this is always position 3, or we're not counting from the beginning to find a particular cell. We're simply saying, here's a pointer to my cell. That's where I want to insert. And so, the, like I said, the examples we'll look at now will be simple with just one position pointer to give you a feel for list modification. But later on, we will indeed have, um, we will indeed deal with uh, multiple um, position pointers. So, on to the next slide. And this is going to illustrate an interesting problem for us that gets into the kind of things we might need to think about with interface design. Here we have a1, a4, a3, a2, and I want to insert x. So there are going to be some current position marker in this class. And we may say, OK, right now it's at a4. Now the question is, what does it mean to insert x into this list? And the options that might immediately spring to mind, well, one of them, which I would say would probably be a bad option, would be to uh, simply write over a4. When we say insert, we don't usually mean write over a value. That would be an update or something. We're saying insert a new value and increase the number of values in the list. So writing over A4 isn't really an option. Certainly we could say inserting X means insert it after the current position, which would mean X would go here. Or it might mean insert before the current position, which would mean X would go here. And that's the idea of before. And if you stop for a moment and think about this, there's a problem with both of those strategies. And I'll pause a second, um, and in my speaking, you can pause your video and see if you can note the problem with both of these strategies. If you pick one or you pick the other, they both have a kind of a serious problem. And, and uh, think for a moment about what that problem would be. So if you have uh, figured it out, good. And if not, I'm going to lead you into it. Consider, let's say, after. We pick after. Um, so we say that the insert procedure is going, is going to insert x after a4. Now, we can insert after a4 without a problem. And we can insert after a3 without a problem just by moving the current position to a3 and then inserting after that. We can insert after a, a2 without a problem and after a1 without a problem. So you think, what's, what's the deal here? We're missing a position. The position before A1 could also be something we want to insert into. And yet, we have no way to insert there because there is no element before that position. If I want to insert here, I have A4 as my current because then I can say insert after that. But I have no element to position myself here and say insert after that element. Therefore, if we make the assumption that I'm going to insert after my current position, I can't insert in the beginning. And likewise, if I choose before, then I can get before a1, before a4, before a3, before a2. But the ending position I'm stuck with, because I have no means of, there's no value that that ending position is before, and therefore insert could never reach that position. So whether we choose to have the insert work as a before or an after concept, we're always going to be missing one position. And so the question is, how do we deal with that? We'd like to, in theory, insert into all the various positions in the list. And when we have four elements in the list, there are five different places we could insert into the slots between or surrounding each of them. 
And we'd like to cover them all. And so just saying, oh, insert means insert after, or insert means insert before, is not the best way to go about things, given this particular view of the list. So what are the possible solutions to this? And the first solution, to me, is not very appealing. But I offer it in, in this, uh, for the sake of you know, uh, offering many different uh, examples. You could say that insert x means insert after. And in order to get this cell, you would have a second function, insert as first. So the idea then it would be your interface would have two functions. And uh, your insert function would always insert after. Uh, if you wanted to get to that first position that the first insert could not reach, you'd have an insert as first function. I tend to think, uh, again, I'm going to stress interface design is the uh, um, decisions of the programmer himself or the software engineers who design, the software engineers who design a class or the programmer himself or, or herself. And so my edicts here are not something that are, are you know, the official word on anything. But I'm going to give you my, my thought process as far as the advantages and disadvantages and then go, deciding which method to go with would be yours. I tend, I tend to think that the idea of interfaces, you'd like your, your function to cover the most general case possible. Uh, if, if, if pos now, that can't always be, be uh, held as an ironclad rule. But the idea here of saying, well, the insert we use only covers half the cases or only covers some of the cases, and we have some specific other function to deal with some other cases, to me, isn't really the best way to go. It's nice to have an inner insert function that covers everything. And we say, the, when the function says insert, it will insert. And we don't need to have some specific function that says, oh, wait, insert doesn't really cover everything, even though the name would suggest it does. And so there's sort of this, um, the disadvantage here would be, I think it's a disadvantage to have a special function for just one case. by another function. I tend to think that, I tend to see that as a disadvantage. Uh, that if you're going to have a special function just to hit one case some other function didn't miss, maybe you could have reworked that other function instead to get that case, or you could restructure these to perhaps, you know, cover more conceptually, have their ranges cover conceptually certain areas of things, rather than just saying, oh, insert and, oh, I missed the first one, so here's a special function just for that. Um, now, that's not always avoidable, and we will see our, our third solution will be something along these lines that I think is a little cleaner than this particular idea. Um, but the, uh, the special case, uh, a function just for the special case, I tend to view as, as not the best choice, though sometimes you may not have a choice. It may be forced upon you. But I think options two and three, in my opinion, are more appealing than this one, and I will try and make the case for that. Solution two. is going to be a, to have a dummy position. And this would have to be built into the list interface itself, which to me then is the disadvantage of it. You've got a function, you've got a slot in your list you have to specifically avoid retrieving from or things like that. Um, you have here some position there, and then A1, A4, A3, A2, or alternatively, you have A1, A4, A3, A2, and then this position there. And then this would use the after assumption, and this would use the before assumption. So the idea here is that there's some physical position that is viewable in the abstract list. We could actually move our current position there and try and read that value, and we would get nothing there. We'd get some sort of garbage value or whatever else happens to be there. So we as programmers now have more responsibility to make sure we don't try and retrieve or use the data in that dummy position. But what it would mean would be that the size of the list would always be, in a sense, one to start out with. The actual size might be zero anyway for an empty list. This dummy position would be an implementation tool. We would know it's there, but we perhaps wouldn't count it when trying to determine the length of the list or something along those lines. But the idea here would be then that um, because the dummy position is there, I could indeed position my current there, and then I would have the ability to go ahead and insert after that, or in this case, position my current at the end and insert before that. 
And now I'm able, with this dummy position there, to cover all these spaces of the list with one function. Insert can be assumed to mean after or can be assumed to mean before, and you put the dummy position accordingly in the appropriate spot. Now, the advantage to this is, ah, adjective, advantage. The advantage to this is one function that works all the time. The disadvantage would be you have a greater responsibility because you must avoid reading the dummy location. It's not real, and so you shouldn't actually read or write to it or make use of the data stored there. So that's a disadvantage. However, you will see that, that the advantages this can bring are enough that um, we will make use of this dummy position uh, later on. The, um, when we talk about the remove algorithm for, for linked implementation of this idea, having the dummy position at the end will be handy. And when we look at the C++ standard template library, for reasons of iterators, which we'll talk about in the third lecture in this sequence, having a dummy position at the end will also be helpful. And so the list class you'll see in section that we'll use for the rest of the term will be one in which we have a dummy position at the end and we then guard around that and make sure we don't use it. But the dummy position will be at the end and will be defined and there will be a way built into the class to let us know we're at that dummy position, which will reduce some of this disadvantage a bit. But it's a very complex issue, so I'm not going to do that right now. Um, I first want to explain how we might go about inserting after or before and discuss some more code issues. So the way we're going to focus on things for the next couple of issues will be, will be the um, solution three. Though there won't really be a whole lot of difference between two and three, but solution three will not require a dummy, dummy position, and so it'll be a little easier to convey the implementation mechanics. And then when we add the dummy position in and things get a little bit more complicated, you'll then at least be familiar with lists enough that it shouldn't be too much of a... Uh, a change. And so solution three, which we will use for the moment, will be to use two functions uh, insert after and insert before. That is, we will have two functions, but each one will cover a wide area of the list. And so it's built into the interface the concept that you can make a decision to insert after or before, insert after or before something. Most positions then are covered double. You have here, if you have A1, A4, A3, A2, I can get these four positions with insert after and these four with insert before. And so therefore, three of the five possible insertion positions are covered two different ways. You can hit them from each of the two functions. So the disadvantage here is, again, we have two functions for inserting. And each one each misses a spot. The advantage to this, however, is firstly no dummy location. And each is more general than to just hit one special case. So I think this has advantages over the first solution for that reason. That each of these can be used in many places. It's not just a function thrown in there to handle one special case. And therefore, each of them could prove useful in many ways. And the disadvantage is it's still two functions, not one. But the, it has the same advantage as the first solution, which is that there is no dummy location. And so I would view this as if you're going to have no dummy location, if that's your goal, this is a much better way to reach that goal than the first solution, in my opinion. And if, you would, if your goal instead is to say, well, I don't care if I have a dummy position as long as there's only one insert function or the one insert can handle everything, 
then number two would be your goal, solution two, where you put in a dummy location and then your insert function can handle all the possibilities. Um, but you have that trade-off forced upon you because there's no way with one insert function and no dummy location to hit everything. And so you're forced to either use a dummy location or to have two separate functions. And I think this is a much better way to have two separate functions than the first case. But anyway, those are different uh, decisions you may make about the uh, uh, list class. You may even indeed put uh, a few more concepts in it as well. We will see that there are a number of different ways we might insert. You could insert one value. You could say insert x copies of a value. So you have variations on the insert as well. But we're just talking here about what possibilities do we have if we're just going to insert one value in a particular spot. The point of all this discussion being that I just wanted to show you an example of how deciding on a proper interface requires some thought, even if you already know basically what the function is going to do. We know we wanted to insert in a particular location. That seems to be cut and dried, but still there's things to think about. And we've seen now three different ways in which that concept could be dealt with. And so interface development is no easy task. In fact, when you're writing a class, um, it's probably the hardest thing to do. That's usually what the, the kind of top-level software engineering jobs are about, is deciding the high-level architecture of the system and how those pieces will, will deal with each other. And because we're dealing with object-oriented programming often in cases like that, the idea is to come up with the interfaces. You have two software components that need to interact. What interface should each of those components have so that they can accurately interact with each other? And then it is up to then, you know, the, the people lower on the totem pole to do the coding. Um, but the, the high level, the design has to come first, especially with object-oriented programming, because the design, if, if you start writing out a bunch of code and then you realize, oh, the design is horrible, then you have to scrap all that code. So you make sure the design is right first. You very carefully think about the interface, everything involved. You want a good class that has an interface that can be usable, whether you're producing you know, code or, or even a, a library to sell, as, as the Java makers um, may have uh, done when designing Java. That was the cell. That was just a language specification. But the same thing applied. There was this immense library, and there were some things that needed to be changed from the version one of that to the next version because uh, some of the functions that were provided weren't maximally useful. And so there will always be some changes that need to be made, but you hope that you keep them to the minimum, and you hope that actually they don't need to have any changes to your interface. But certainly you want to minimize any changes that do need to be made. It has been said that the interfaces are the true intellectual property of a, of a uh, a corporation or a software design house. And I think that would be a, certainly an interesting statement with a large bit of truth to it. Um, once you know your interface, yeah, you can implement the class and, and you know, some good programmer can optimize it. But, but if you don't have your interfaces good and, and clear and easy to use and useful, then your class is useless because everything about the class works with the interface. And so if it seems like I'm beating a dead horse, it's because I want to stress that interface design is very important for object-oriented programming. That said, time to move on to implementations. And the implementation we will focus on for the, first, for the moment here is the array implementation. So this is the array implementation of the list ADT. We, so the idea here will be that behind the scenes, What's making these functions work is an array. And so the way we would have that worked out would be, here's our array. And let's say I have here 2, 6, 8, 7, and 1. And maybe there's a few extra cells in the array as well. I have here now, um, this is maybe index 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And I have some current that let's say is position 3. And I have some size variable, perhaps, that indicates, OK, I have five elements in this array. The idea is that this would be uh, implementing an array that looked like this, 2, 6, 8, 7, 1, with 8 as the current element. So there's our conceptual view. The way we would implement this would be with an array. And what we then need, OK, we've decided on our, this will be our private data, two integers and an array of integers or whatever. And what we need to decide then is exactly how these operations we want to run on this abstract data would actually be implemented to run on the array. Now, some of them would be very straightforward. So we could say, for example, if I have, if I'm trying to um, run forward one, which would move the current uh, indicator forward one. 
You'll notice here as I write these out, it's going to be very pseudocodish. I'm not going to be putting return types often. I'm not going to be scoping into the class name. I will tend to leave out special cases. Uh, I'm trying to get just at the sort of the guts uh, or the, the, the um, key ideas behind these. You'll see plenty of list code where you'll see all the details about special cases and scoping and all that. I'm doing this in a more of a pseudocode fashion. Four to one should simply involve saying current plus plus. I have current right now three, and so eight is my current position. If I want to move my current position to seven, all I'm really doing is taking my current index and moving it to from three to four. And now a of four, which is seven, is my current position. And that might be relevant because if I have some sort of retrieve function where the purpose of this function was to return the current element, all I would have to do here would be to say return a of current. So prior to calling forward one, current was three. And so if I did a retrieve, I would get the value eight because current was three. If I return a of current, that would return a of three, and that was eight. On the other hand, after calling forward one, current is four, and so just as my abstract diagram there has seven underlined, meaning retrieve should send back the number seven. Likewise, if I would call retrieve, that will return a of four, and that would be returning seven. So the point is that I would say, I would have this abstract picture in front of me, and I would say, forward one, and then retrieve should send back seven, and the implementation of these functions should be keeping up with that. So that if I run a sequence of things like, given this picture, run forward one, and then retrieve, and I know that should give me seven based on my picture, I can tell here in my implementation as well, calling forward one moves current to four, then retrieve returns a of four, and that is indeed seven. So that's what I meant last time when talking about an abstract data type by the conceptualization or the mental picture. This is our mental picture this list. And as I run the operations on them, I would just have the interface themselves, the function signatures. I run forward one on that list and then retrieve on that list. And whatever I expect to happen based on the particular functions I called and the documentation of what those functions do, I need to make sure that the implementation of these functions and the way I represent my data behind the scenes is such that what I expect to happen in any combination of functions is actually what happens. It wouldn't do me any good to say forward one and then retrieve and have forward one not do anything and therefore retrieve returns eight and not seven. As a user, as a client, I'm gonna write code that what I would expect, given that list, if I call forward one and retrieve, I should get back seven. And the implementation of these functions needs to keep up with what I expect to see happen by running them on the abstract picture. But the point then is, if that's done correctly, I can, as a programmer, view things just like this on paper and say, so now if I wanted to print out seven, I would call forward one and then retrieve, and that should indeed print out seven. And because the class has been written correctly, we assume, then I'm able to write code like that and have the code do exactly what I planned it to do on paper. And so that's the idea of an abstract data type or, or one of the uses. I can basically plan things out on paper and the code I write because the implementation is assumed to support those interface functions will do exactly what I thought it would do on paper. Anyway, that said, we now have the idea here. Those are pretty simple functions and so they're only one line. If I'm going to deal with the idea here of insert after, again, I'll write this code up here. I could have here now, here's A, two, six, eight, seven, one. Two more slots there, perhaps. Current is, say, four now. Size is um, five. Actually, I'm going to say, for the sake of our, our example here, current, let's say, is two. And so our list looks like this. We have two six, eight, seven, one. And let's say I call on that list, insert after, and I want to pass in nine. 
And so our assumption is that, or the, the documentation of insert after would probably say that that means we would insert 9 after the current position, which would mean right there. And that's all well and good to draw that in our abstract picture. The problem is that drawing that inside my implementation here, I forgot the indices of the array. Inserting 9 between 6 and 8 in my implementation doesn't seem to work because I have no rule. 6 and 8 are immediately on different cells. And furthermore, I can't just stick 9 in cell 6 after 1 because my other functions, including current and such, are assuming that this data is in sequence. When I said forward 1 means just move the current value incremented by 1, that's assuming that if I want to move from 6 to 8, I just increment that current. That is, it's assuming the index of 6 is 1 less than the index of 8, if conceptually 6 is just before 8. So my other functions are assuming that the data is kept in sequence in the array in the same order that it is supposed to be in conceptually. Now, if we wanted to relax that restriction, we could, but then we'd have to do, make the other functions handle that appropriately. So we could go either way. I'm just going to pick one of the ways for the sake of describing things, and I'm going to go with we're making the assumption that our data in our array is stored in the same order that it would be kept in conceptually, in the mental picture. So the other functions we would write, including forward one, as we've already seen, take advantage of that assumption. That's how we've chosen to organize our data. Insert after, then, is a victim of that choice. Just like if we had chosen to just say, well, insert after can just, just dump nine wherever it feels like. If we're going to make that choice, then the other functions have to be coded appropriately, and they're victims of that other choice. So you have sometimes some compromises to make where the ideal decisions for certain functions are not the ideal data arrangement decisions for other functions. You need to decide exactly what implementation serves you best. And what will serve us best here is to keep things in the, in the same order that they're in conceptually. So that does mean, however, that insert after needs to be dealt with somehow. And so if I need to conceptually put 9 between 6 and 8, then I'm saying I'm going to do that in the implementation as well. And that means now that all this data needs to be moved over. I need to one by one move a of, a of uh, move one from a of five to a of six, move seven from a of four to a of five, move eight from a of three to a of four, and now two and six were not moved. I now have this location into which I can write nine. That is, in order to do an insertion, if I'm going to implement with an array, it requires me to go to the particular location I want to insert into, and every value from that position on needs to be shifted to the right one cell. And that's going to be the case whether we're doing insert after or whether we're doing insert before. Insert before would just mean that now 6 would have needed to be scooted over as well because I want to write into where 6 is, not the position after 6. Likewise, with remove, if I want to remove, say, 2, my other functions are not assuming I have empty gaps in the middle of things. And therefore, if I'm dealing with remove, I would need to shift everything down in order to cover up that cell. So if I got rid of 2, I'd need to shift 6, 8, 7, and 1 over to fill in that, because we're assuming that all my real data is located in cells 1 through whatever. And that could, if we don't make that assumption, that likewise would affect other functions. But we'll make that assumption here. And so, therefore, that means if I don't want big gaping holes in my data set, um, then I need to go ahead and shift everything over for a remove. So the issue here is, now these are not quite as simple, and I'm not going to write out all the code here. I'll leave that as an exercise for you, or you can see examples of it uh, when you look at what the TAs go over in section. But the... the uh, issue here is that if I'm going to run an insert after or an insert before or a remove, that's not as easy as the previous two functions. I'll have to have a loop that will go, in the case of insert after, from the last cell to the one I want to insert into and move values over, copy them into the cell after them one by one until I've opened up that space. And that will have effects on the running time of those functions, as we'll talk about just in a minute at the very end of this lecture. So there's an example of the implementation requiring a little more work to be manipulated. The other interesting thing to mention is a find function. 
And this might be one very good reason to hold on to the size of your array somehow, or the number of data you're keeping. Because we've made our array large enough for some expansion in the future. And so size here refers to the actual size of the conceptual um, list, which is five elements. You might have questions like, well, what happens if I'm on position five as my current, and then I say forward one? Or what happens when I have the entire array filled up and I need to then have more space, but it's not available? Those kind of things, again, are just special cases. The TAs will go over some of them. Some of them we might ask you on on a quiz. You can do some of them based on uh, exercises yourself. Um, but the idea is that I'm just trying to hit here the, 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 uh, the key concepts. Those tiny special cases are just little snippets of code that would handle one case or another. And we'll talk about some of them as we go, and some of them the TAs will talk about. And some of them you're welcome to ask about, but if you don't, we'll just leave it for you to kind of look at a bit. The other issue here is searching. Let's say I want to search down this array um, for, say, the value 7. I don't know where 7 is. I mean, I can look at the picture and see it's at cell 4. But if I'm just given this list here, 2, 6, 8, 7, 1, and I want to say, does this list contain 7, the computer doesn't see it all in one big view. Certainly on paper, I could point out directly position 4. But here's a spot where the conceptualization, we really have to remember how this would be dealt with. In order to write an algorithm that would search for 7, I need to basically inspect the cells one by one. With our human eyes, with this list on paper, we can see that it holds in cell 7. But if we didn't happen to know these values, if we had here A1, A2, A5, A3, A4, and we're wondering, OK, I know these are various positions in my list. Which one is 7? I just know conceptually I will have added data to this list, and I'm examining that on paper. But I don't know if any of them was 7 or not, because I don't know what the data was. The user perhaps inputted it as the program ran. So then we have to, then it's a little clearer that just looking at the picture isn't enough. We actually have to some, have some sort of algorithm that will individually test if each value is 7. And so in that case, then we could say perhaps start here and say, is that 7? No. Move over here. Is that 7? No. Move over here. Is that 7? No. Move over here. Is that 7? Yes, it is. And so we might perhaps then return a 1 if we find the value and a 0 if we don't. And what does it mean that we don't find 7? Well, not finding 7 would mean we inspected every single value and none of them was 7. So if we were in searching here for 9, I would say none of these were 9, that wasn't 9, that likewise wasn't 9, and so I moved on to the end of the list. And so that's where the size field could come in handy. I could go ahead and say something like int i equals 1, and I could say while a of i is not equal to, um, actually let me put it in a different order, while i is less than or equal to size and a of i is not equal to x. And then we have some loop here, but this would be our condition. I have two conditions I'm worried about as I'm searching. First, I want to make sure at every point that i is a legal index, which means it's between 1 and the size of the array. The size is 5, and I'm looking at i equals 6. That is not a cell I should read because it's just garbage. And I'll keep proceeding in my while loop if i is less than size and the value at i is not equal to what I'm looking for. That means move on. And so this while loop actually wouldn't even need a, 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 a braces. I could just say i++ plus plus here. And so I'm simply saying here, move i forward from 1 as long as I haven't yet run off the end of my legal data and that I haven't yet found an i for which a of i really is x. And then when we exit that while loop, we could have some additional code to decide, well, if, a, if i was equal to size plus 1, then that meant we ran off the end of the array, we returned 0. Otherwise, we return 1 because we did find it and we stopped early. So those would be the kind of things we might do for a find operation. But the key idea here is there's no magic way to know where 7 is located. We will have to search the array cell by cell in order to find it. There are many other operations we could look at for this too, but those are the interesting ones. The last thing to concern ourselves with is analysis. This is where big O notation comes in. We looked at a few functions today. Uh, we looked at the idea of forward 1. And all that did was we incremented current to the next value up. And adding 1 to an integer is going to take the same amount of time no matter how many cells exist in the list. And so if n is the number of cells in the list, this should be a constant time operation. 
Ford 1 does not depend on the size of the list. It runs equally fast no matter how many elements we have. Likewise for retrieve. We have current, we're just saying return A of current. Given an array and an index accessing that cell in the array is a constant time operation. So that's not a problem. On the other hand, we also looked at insert. Insert after, and this would be the same likewise for insert before and um, insert uh, for, and for remove. Insert after required taking an array and shifting some number of values over. So in the worst case, the absolute worst case we can imagine is that we'd be trying to insert in the very first position. If we were trying to insert in the very first position in the array, if we were inserting as the first element in the list, every position in the array would have needed to be shifted over to the right one cell to make room for that in that very first cell to insert. And since there would be n items in the array, that would mean we would need to do n shifts, n copies of one value to a different cell. And the larger n becomes, the, lar the more time that will take. In particular, it'll take an extra little bit of constant time of work for every shift. Because each shift is constant time. Each shift doesn't, you're just copying one array value to another. That time of that particular operation doesn't vary no matter how long the list is. So every, moving, every movement of one value to the cell to its right would be a constant time operation. And in the worst case, we have n of them to do for the n different values in the list. Therefore, that's big O of n. And if you're not so familiar with big O notation, um, that was a pre that's a prereq for this course, but if you're not familiar with it, take a look at packet 8. Uh, most of packet 8 was not the abstract data type stuff. That was a little bit in packet 8. Most of packet 8 was simply a review of big O notation and the reasons for object-oriented programming. And so um, there's a bit on the beginning on, on um, algorithm analysis that you should definitely take a look at if you're not familiar with that, these ideas. The same thing would have been said for insert before, because it would insert before just depended where we started. Um, now, in the average, we would expect we wouldn't be inserting at the very beginning of this li list ADT, and therefore not at the very beginning of the array. But we wouldn't be inserting at the very end of it either, which would be the very nice case. We might expect an average that if this is our array, maybe somewhere in the halfway point, we're inserting. And half the time, maybe we're inserting a little bit after that. Half the time, we're inserting before that. But on the average, somewhere in the middle of the array is where we would expect to be inserting. And therefore, the average case could be thought of as requiring n over 2 shifts. And that's still big O of n. They're still, the, they're still linear functions. The worst case grows with this, at the same rate as the average case does. They're both going to depend on the size of the array or the size of your list, your conceptual list. When it doubles, the worst case time will double. The average case time will also double. It'll just happen that no matter how big your, your list gets, the average case time would be about half of the worst case time. But their rate of growth would be the same. It would be linear on the size of the list, purport, proportional to the size of the list. The same thing would be the case for remove, would also be that. The only difference would be this time we'd be saying, in the worst case, we're removing this very last element and therefore shifting everything over. In the average case, we maybe are removing an element halfway in between and then therefore only shifting half the values over to cover up that space. But we still have a worst and an average case of order, t order and time. And if you're actually to look at the constants behind those concepts, the worst case time would be linear. The average case time would be about half of that. But it it's still linear, but it would be about half the worst case time. And then finally, the other value we inspected was find. And the idea of find is, in the worst case, we search array with no luck. The worst case would be an unsuccessful search. We search the entire array. We don't find our value. But if we've looked one by one at all the cells of the array, inspecting one cell and saying, is this equal to 7 or not, that's a constant time operation. We're retrieving the value, and we're doing a comparison. Those the time to retrieve one value from the array, the time to do a single comparison, does not change based on the size of the array. So they're going to be constant, but we're doing a bunch of them because we're inspecting every cell of the n cell array. And so therefore, if we search the array with no luck, that would have to be linear time. Because it would mean we search all the way down to the end of the array with no luck.
Uh, the average case, well, again, on the average, we would expect to um, search maybe half of the array. And if we would expect to search half of the array, then that's still going to be linear time, just again, just like with insert and after, insert after and insert before and remove, we would expect the average case search time to be about half of the worst case search time. We would expect that we'd search half the array and then find what we're looking for. Sometimes it may be less, sometimes it may be more, but on the average, it would be about half the array. And so there's, that's the idea of the analysis here. Forward one and retrieve and other functions of its type would be constant, but anything that involves searching down the array would be linear. Initialize would be another such function. If I want to read every single cell and write into those cells new values, that would be um, linear time. And actually inserting or removing from the array implementation would also be linear time because it would involve, in the worst case, shifting everything over, and even in the average case, shifting half the values over. And so um, the array implementation has those disadvantages. If we're trying to run list ADT functions on the array implementation, we have advantages like that where you're saying, if I want to actually insert in the middle of my list, I need to go shifting all these values around in an array in order to do it. And that will be one of the disadvantages of the array implementation and one of the reasons we will inspect, which we'll start next time, the linked implementation of the list ADT. So there's a little bit of information on the array implementation, and we'll leave it there, and we'll pick up with linked implementation in the next lecture. See you then.